All right, welcome back. So last time on our uh, Power Baseball League Adventures <laughs> series here, we, uh, Kylie and I dove into building out the customer voice. And so we, we've got that all built out. We found the CDS environment. Truthfully, it took us a little bit of time to find it. So if you're looking for it, don't be discouraged if you can't find it right away. Um, Kylie shared some tips on that video on where to find it. So, so go back and watch that one. Um, so now that we've got all that built out, we're now ready to tackle that whole Power Automate piece, the flow behind the scenes that's going to take the submissions in from that, that um, customer voice form and hopefully pass that data into our CDS environment, into, into our Power Baseball League management system and create our contacts for us and all of that good stuff. So we invited uh, yet another special guest to join us to help us kind of map out the logic. And we are very uh, glad to have Todd Mercer join us. So Todd, maybe you can do a quick introduction to who you are, where you're from, what your background is, and and then we'll dive in. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I appreciate you guys inviting me in. It's been, uh, it's been a fun series to listen, listen to from the comforts of home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So my name is Todd Mercer. I'm uh, currently a technical specialist working for Microsoft in specializing in Dynamics 365 in the Power Platform. Uh, before joining Microsoft, though, I, I, I spent 14 years in, in a customer role, and, and 10 of those years was uh, extending and developing on the platform all the way from 2011, 2013, all the way up to the cloud uh, with, a, with a big migration two years ago, back in, in 2019, to move up to Dynamics 365. So, I it's uh, def definitely uh, it's been a fun path, but now it's it's really exciting on the on the Microsoft side to uh, use my knowledge to help other customers uh, be successful on their journeys with with Dynamics 365 in the platform. So you you in all that time, I know this isn't part of our script, but y you know with that longevity in terms of history, you remember the day before Power Platform was even a thing, and it's like before we ever even had these tools. So you've seen that evolution really from when it started to where we are today, and and continuing, right? Um, it's been a pretty wild ride along it's, the way. It's it's been uh, an interesting ride. I mean, I, I when I started, it was on a single DVD, uh, and my you know my boss came over and says, "Here, install this on the server and and get started," and that that was my introduction to Dynamics. Wow. So. That that was the start, and now um, I mean, not the DVDs are still a thing. I don't think you can fit the entire platform even on probably ten DVDs. It, it's gotten so such a, a massive scale of of the platform horizontally. I mean, everything from customer engagement, sales, service, power platform, Canvas. I mean, it's just uh, just a huge platform, and that's even before you even start anywhere close to. Um, you know the the FNO project operations, all the other components for mm -hmm. the Dynamics 365 platform that are now out there. It's just uh, it's impressive. But you know, as uh, I always like the Lego analogy, where it's you know, growing up with Legos, you're always excited when you get more sets to come into your collection. And you know, it's, this is the, the the whole platform right now is just a big bucket of Legos to go build new tools, new platforms, new new applications. So it's really cool. Never mind that. That we don't even have it. I don't even have a DVD or a CD spot on my device now. <laughs> so yeah, I couldn't yeah. do that, even if I tried. And yeah, I could so. do this call from the space station apparently. So um, how the times have changed. So we're we're going to go from that time when you, you know, back when you had to install it on a DVD, to now we're talking about having different systems and taking the data from one and leveraging the, the CDS and the common data model and passing that data from, from one place to another, I mean, utterly seamlessly, which is pretty amazing. But before we dive into that, one of the things we talked about offline was the importance of kind of planning it out. And so we could just dive in and start building the flow, but we'd probably run into lots of hurdles. So getting our head around where we need to start is kind of probably the best place to, to begin. Would you guys agree? Yeah, it's definitely uh, my my go-to spot before diving into anything new. It's um, you know we uh, in my customer days we used to joke it's uh, you know make sure you have the napkin design first. <laughs> uh, you, you need that little scribble from the, on the napkin that you got with you know two minutes you were talking with the boss. This is what he wanted. You scribbled it down on a napkin and you walk back to your desk and now you're about to approach it. So and the napkin design is. is it's worth his weight in gold sometimes. Mm. So 
so true. I think just just this week we were saved by needing by taking the time to, you know, draw something out and and graph out what what your workflow should be doing, what your processes should be doing. It's a great way to have something for people to sign off on, something to test against, check for all your logical gaps and things like that. So I think this is where we we left off yesterday, um, not yesterday, last time on looking at kind of what the survey response looks like and how this data comes in. So I have that up for us to reference if we need to kind of look at that and review. But I think we wanted to, we have a whiteboard ready so we can start drawing what, what this is gonna look like, what we're expecting, what the steps in this flow are gonna be. And we're gonna try and use whiteboard and all draw together and see what happens. It's our, it's our digital napkin. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never used I've seen this and I've dabbled with it, but I've never actually used it. So this whole series, I mean, as much as we're talking about the baseball league, this is also about exploring new technology. So here's a new one. Let's give it a shot. I'm not... Let's try it out. Okay. All right. So where do we begin? So first our responses come in, right? Can we, mm -hmm. can we start with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Let's do that. How do I type? Oh, did I turn off my uh, snap to shapes? Uh, my shape no, was it. just that bad that it, <laughs> it did. Just, it just doesn't know. It just doesn't yeah. know what you're trying to do. So this is when a new one comes in. Beautiful. Beautiful. Then, so yeah. Then what do we do? Not. <laughs> Not that. No. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's a new response, and now it's sort of, I, I guess, the first decision tree. And I think what we have to do with this, um, in following along with the series, is, is um, we have to create the parent. So the parent just registered. So the parent is where we would um, anchor the children to. So with the new response, you know, the first thing we want to look at is actually creating that parent record for us and, uh, and, and moving all that data off the response out into the contact. I think there, there is a, a text box as well. That would be a bit easier. Why don't I see that option? Oh, how did you, you do that? You have to, <laughs> yeah, you have to turn off the pen. Oh, I have to turn off. Oh, that would be much easier. Oh, okay. Let yeah, me erase. Let me erase what I just did there. And we're not going to, I mean, we're not going to clear. We're not going to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? we're not going to creating the parent is more than just creating the parent right because yeah. we're going to need to find that data first from the response right so right yeah i think in flow like I, it's important to remember that um on the on the initial trigger you don't always have the full context of the record so sometimes it's helpful um i find as a best practice to even refetch the whole record so you have the whole context so even though your trigger is on new response, um, at times when I build flow, they, I even just go back to fetch it again. And that way you're guaranteed to have the full complement of the whole record. And then, then you got full access to all the attributes um, for dynamic use later on. But oh. We're getting the response. And then we're also going to need to get the, um, what are the, the survey questions, right? Uh, yeah, right, because it breaks it out into multiple questions. So you'd have to go and pick them up. So it, it seems to create, if you flip back, Kylie, for a second to the yeah. um, CDS environment, it's got the, at the bottom there, there are questions individually. So can we grab all of those at once or do we, we don't have to grab each in, like when we say get responses, get cert, get yeah. related survey questions, it's going to grab all the ones that came in, right? For that transaction, so to speak. Yeah, well, uh, you can probably just say go get responses, right? Um, and then basically you, you would cycle through them afterwards because you would say go, um, you go get your responses in relation to the survey response, right? Yeah. So. So okay. what would happen is your trigger is there's uh, Todd responded. Todd is registering the four kids. Um, and then you're saying, okay, well, 
Todd registered. I need the response and the responses to the actual questions. Assuming that there's attributes at the response layer that you want to deal with. Most of the time, I think in, in the way you guys have it set up is that you're getting all the data off the question answers. Right. The response is uh, more the the administration layer of the data, whereas the question responses actually has the data that we're interested in the system. Yeah, so what you're, yeah, that makes sense. Because if you look at what we see on screen now, that customer voice up in the top left, customer voice survey yeah. response, and then there's the question responses, the individual question responses. So that, that okay, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Right. And yeah, so then for the parent, we're going to need to, within those responses, find the one named phone number, last name, first name. And at the beginning, we also need to find the how many question, right? To, Correct. Yeah. So we'll need to know. So we would we'll need to know what all of our specific questions. And I think they're I think the way I framed them when we built it was um, the parent ones are just the the like first name, last name, email. But then the child information is I think I called it participant one first name, participant two first name, participant three first, okay. so on. So we'll have to you'd have to know all of that as we start to parse it out. And we'll see those as dynamic fields so we can put like when we're building a flow and i've got some experience with flow but not a ton but i recall when you when you're building out a piece you actually have the ability to tell it from the dynamic list and so we yeah. should see all of those responses there but you see, all, yeah, you see the attributes at the response right right so that the attribute would be question and yeah then we would be looking for name. So we wouldn't see like first name as a dynamic value. Oh, OK, got you. Right? Yeah. So yeah, so it, it is your your flow would is going to end up having a lot of looping structures um, because you're going to go up uh, like in your, all, the, all the questions and then we're going to loop through them and you're going to have to inspect them to take a different action each time, right? That's right. the way I that's the way I would would uh, approach it first, All right? So you you pull out your related questions, and then uh, to Kylie's point, right? It's just like, okay, on the first pass, is this the question? Is this sorry the first name question? If so, um, you're likely the way you're probably going to do it is you probably want to fill up a bunch of variables um, first, I think. I'm going to try it. And th this is why I, I love the napkin approach, because you, you can scribble down the best way that you might want to approach it. And when you actually go to build it, um, you may not build it exactly the same. Right. So like I, I would think you, you can either, I think the variable approach might be easier because you can cycle through each one of the questions and load up a bunch of variables with all the attributes. And that way, when you go to write the answer out or sorry commit the parent for example it's just one write versus um, on each pass create the parent and then on each pass after that you know for last name date of birth you're doing updates back to that parent record so you're you're doing more api transactions back and forth whereas i think if you go get go get all your questions bring them in and then when you cycle through them, you load up a bunch of variables. And then at the end, you say, well, I'm done now. I could just write them out in one commit. Now, I'm not sure if that would actually work out. But this is, this is why, like, yeah, I, I think we draw it our, our best approach. And mm -hmm. then we, you you tinker with it a little bit in flow. Because I think committing the parent is the first trip, first hurdle. Right. Um, and then the more difficult one is depending on how many children we have to work with. Yeah, and that's where we have that question in there. It, it, I think we can depend on that, right? So if the value of that question is one, then we know to go and grab one. If, we, if it was two, then we know we got to go grab two. Um, but I don't know necessarily where we would put that in here. Yeah, I, I I think there's an option. I was I was debating a little bit before we got on, like even how to uh, approach that. And one idea would would be to actually ignore that answer altogether. Um, and and that idea would be 
it doesn't matter if there's one or four filled out. You can filter on whether or not you actually have the data. Does data it exist? Yep, that makes sense. Um, now I don't I don't know customer voice that that well. You know, as, as we're talk, talking in the intro there, like how big the platform is, it's hard to get to know every mm-hmm. every piece uh, well. Um, so the million dollar question would be from a testing point of view is what happens when you fill a survey with one child? Right. Do you get, does it create a, uh, a survey question response for the ones you don't fill out? I don't think it would. So those records wouldn't exist. Did we test that, Kylie? I thought I we did. I think we did. So this one we're looking at was, um, we had four responses, but this other response that we have here, um, so here we go. I don't think we, I think we only had one child there. So let's pull it up. Yes, we're back at the survey. So let's look at our related responses. And we wanna pull up the older one. So here yeah. we're seeing just one, right? So how many question responses are below? The last one there was 17. Now there's only seven. seven. Perfect. Hmm. So that so does that mean though that we can avoid that question or we do need to? Because if we avoid that question and tell it Oh no! Never mind. Your logic was we can we can tell it to go ahead and just have a variable in there that set maybe variable is the wrong word, but have a clause in there that says if if first name has data in the response, then do it. But there is no response for that to check against in this scenario. Right. Yeah. So I mean, my my first thought that I scribbled down was um, kind of to leverage kind of to kick off multiple branches in the flow, kind of in a parallel branching structure. So okay. basically you say, you know, after you create the parent record, go off and do these four different branches, which essentially says if there's data in either one of them, create the children and relate them to the parent. Was was my first thought about how to approach it. Um, but I think because you know, you what we could do is uh, on the first get related survey questions, you we could add sort of some fetch there to maybe filter specifically to the parent related questions. Um, and then the second one, after you create the parent, maybe we go back and get the, the questions related to the youth. If there is, uh, cause I think I, by looks of having, you already have a naming convention of youth one, youth two, so on and so forth. So you can perhaps curve up some fetch XML and say, go get me all the questions with youth in them. Okay. Um, and then you maybe maybe kind of in a similar token, or actually what you could do then is similar to what we do with the parent model, just start cycling through and creating uh, some variables to load them up, right? So I go pick up all my questions, and then for each one, if I have first youth and a first name, put it in a variable. If I have youth and a second name and a last name, sorry, put it in another variable. And then if I have um, set the date of birth to the youth one date of birth, create child record, create a relationship, and then move on to the next record. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, th- this is where it, it you know, the, this whiteboard experience, I think, presents a bit of a challenge that it, it'd be easier to write it out on an actual yeah. wall whiteboard. But I think I follow what you're saying. Um, yeah, I find my mouse here, but it's going to work with me tonight. Uh, there we go. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use a blue pen to go from here. Kind of what I'm thinking is more like after we after we create your contact, you would have to kind of go back and get uh, a perfect square. Um, you'd have to go back and pick up the uh, the child, the uh, uh, like that. 
It's going to let me move it, all right? Let's see. Nope, it's moving the whole way board. Carly, can you move that text? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's my, my whiteboard is moving me all around here. Um, so the idea is saying basically we go back and, and you pick up all the questions that are related um, to the youth, kind of following your naming convention that you have created with youth one, youth two, youth three. Um, I'm not even sure this is going to work, but we'll, we'll play it. We'll play the scenario out. Um, and then we, when we move on to the next step, the idea would be then kind of a, a bigger box of operations um, for each child then basically what we would say is um is there each one there one we, rec yeah and we do have like the number of children too so we could also use can we do a loop that we say is going to happen this number of times and set it to that value that we received back from the survey and i guess then the question would be would we put the fetch in there and just fetch those for youth for whatever survey whatever loop number we are on grab that youth number of that file the fields and then create that record and then do it again for each other one and i'm not i'm not 100 sure how to do an exit in in the for each based on the number of records we have um I, I, you know I, stealing words from from an old college professor you can try it we'll see if it works <laughs> <laughs> uh going back to learning but where i was where i was kind of going with this sort you for each loop um so so basically you would have to uh for each loop of the record, you would have to go and say, is this the date of birth? Yes, set this variable. And then, oh, I, think, uh, I, gotta, I gotta pause and think now because it comes in in multiple questions. This is where you want kind of phone a friend or like a lifeline. <laughs> and That's I why we called that you. you. Guys, <laughs> I realized that you guys told me and I'm like, I'm getting stumped right now on how to approach this. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm th I think I'm I'm in the right spot. I think this is one where if you had it open, you can start thinking about how you want to start processing. But I, I, I like you go and get the records for the youth one and then what? Can you show me the screen again where they come in? They come in three different records. Your parallel, is, but your parallel blank branch suggestion. Could we not do that based on the output of the of the number of children the person's registering so so i i'm almost wondering if it comes down and says okay if they said one to this then create three well a parallel branch means basically after after you create the parent it would kick off four branches always um, four we couldn't control it would, that it would, number it would start the four it, it wouldn't oh, okay. condition, it wouldn't conditionally start them well uh, but we could set that and say branch one if if that equals one, do this. If this, if branch two, if number equals one or two, keep going. Branch three, if number equals three, one, two, or three, keep going. And if it was yeah, a, and, and you, know. you can definitely put a ch um, you know a, a check at the top of the branch and kind of have a gracefully exit, where it's it's a conditional check that says um, if number of children is one. There's a yes side that continues on doing work. And then in, in your second branch, you can say if the number of children was two, then both branch one and two would still be successful. I think that's where you're going, right, Kai? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on the, on the no side of each of that condition, you can just tell the flow and say, I'm done. Like there's nothing for you to do. This is a, it's a graceful exit. Um, so you could definitely do it that way. And then, then, to this model, what we kind of have here, you you would still have a fetch record to go back and pick up. Then each branch would be very specific to youth one, youth two, youth three, youth four questions. Yeah. And then then, would... Sorry. Ahead. Then the question would be, if we're talking about licensing and API limits and all of that, is it better to data at the beginning and then review it? on each branch or 
does it make a difference if each branch, if we're fetching those specific question answers? Um, yeah, I, I mean, when it comes to the API limits, I, I, I get stumped. There's been a few times actually in the last few weeks I've had to go back and reread the documentation and wonder if it's an internal API call versus external and does it get consumed? I think at the end of the day, like there's there's a hundred thousand API calls per user per day. So I think under the volume, you know, unless you guys are reaching major league baseball size for <laughs> registration limits. <laughs> I mean probably. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, once once this gets out there, I, I think you you be under from an API limit perspective. Yeah, fair enough. Um and and you know, and, and there's also the aspect too that which is important from a learning point of view. Sometimes it's it's there's a lot of value in having a working version. It may not be the best version, but it works. Um, and then you're 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 at a point where you're going to have an M, a functional MVP that you can iterate on and start improving and start learning. I think that's a really important aspect. I think a lot of people when they start with with Power Automate and the Power Platform that they um, it can seem daunting until they get that first win under their belt. Um, and then they feel a lot more confident and they, they have something that's functional and then you just keep going from it. So I love that suggestion because it's I think a lot of times we we strive for aim for perfection right out of the box. And the reality yeah. is if we can just get this to grab the responses and parse out the parent ones, yeah. that's step one in the right direction. Then then let's tackle right. what comes next. Right. So, and, yeah, I love that. And, and that's that's I mean, that, that's also a perfect segue. I mean, you you could really, you know, cut the flow off and I drew, I drew on the whiteboard. But the idea, like, even if you got the white, the, the flow working to the point where you're saying, I'm creating the parent, and that's it, you know, and, and this is my, my, my stop gap here, right, is, is my, my first win, this is where I am, right, where we say there's a response, uh, I went and picked up the data, I cycled through it, I create my parent record. And you know, that m might give us, getting that to work may give us some insight that we can apply to getting the kid, the, the child, the youth data in, right? Yeah. Ultimately, I think you're going to repeat the same model, right? Um, in that. working through how you know the the concept of saying I have three records that have different attributes that belong to the same parent. The question is now is like, how do you cycle through and load them up, or, or set the right variables along the way? Um, and I'm I'm trying to think through how that works in in the for each mechanism. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that's kind of how you would have to approach it. And what it, when you work the model out from the parent, it's the same model that's going to work exactly for the children because you're still fetching, pardon me, uh, three records for the each of the children. Right. Um, and then, then like we discussed, where you put the condition at the top, you, you can create a, a graceful exit if you have only one children, two children, three or four. Right. If there's only one, if the condition is based on, you know, that the number of children being registered was only one, then two, three and four all grades really exit. Hmm. OK, cool. Well, I think this is a good I think we've got to a good state, actually, and we're right probably at the time that we wanted to stick to. So I mm -hmm. think this gives us a good next step, which would be to start to get up to that breaking point like we talked about. So I think that's something Malcolm and I can take away, see if we mm -hmm. can grab those survey responses and make them into a contact for the parent. And then we can kind of figure out where to go from there. And maybe Todd, then we can bring you back to help with the next steps. Does yeah. that sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you don't have it all in one flow. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's a parent right. flow and maybe there's uh, you know, no pun intended, but a child flow to create the child uh, that we kick off, right? That, that you know, it's just they're doing the work so that it, it helps break down the complexity so that there's a clear cut of a start and end for the parent and then create a new flow of the processes of the child records to create the children. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I, this is as, I mean, as far as I think we can probably go right now without getting a functional start to it and see where we where we go but i yeah. between the whiteboard here and and the whiteboard here on my desk um i think we've got lots to go on 
right, to get started. Yeah, it's important to have that napkin because then we can you, know, you can always at least come back to it. You know, we can pick this up tomorrow or, or a few days from now. At least you come back to it. And you have this kind of at least this is where my head was at two days ago. This is what yeah. I think was going to work, <laughs> and then then you come back to it. Well, and this whole series has been as much emphasis on the the importance of planning and mapping out and thinking about it as opposed, you know, sometimes we see these things and it's great content. I'm not slamming the content at all, but we see like, here's how to go and build this great thing. And it's amazing. But without understanding what went into planning that and and how to click all the right things right away, I, very few Absolutely. people are going to sit down in front of this and build it perfectly the first time. They're going to run into to hurdles. And I think the planning part is a, a good part. So Absolutely. I love it. I like where we're at. All right. Well, thanks so much, Todd, for joining us and helping us talk through this. And for all of you guys listening at home, you know, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.